So I think we can start. Yeah. Uh, so this is our person and your science seminar, and we are offering uh, this semester. And as I told you, we are addressing different topics, but since you're going to be traveling, you won't be able to join us for uh, things like uh, freedom of the wheel or uh, personal identity. So you can talk to us today about perception, and okay. then if there is time, we may bombard you with other things, um, even if it's a little, we're going to be dealing with it later in the semester. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, I'm going to talk about perception, but I want to situate that within the context of the pro general problematic of contemporary philosophy. Uh, philosophy has changed a lot in my lifetime, uh, 50 years ago, or maybe it was more than 50 years ago when I was really a student of the subject. The main topic in philosophy was language, and it was widely felt that most, and maybe even all, philosophical problems could be solved by paying close attention to the operation of language. And some philosophers, notably Wittgenstein, thought that philosophical problems arose because we fail to understand the operation of language. Now, I don't think many people believe that still today, but we are much more sensitive, much more self-conscious about the operation of language, and particularly about the role of language in the creation, formulation, and eventual, uh, we hope, solution of philosophical problems. Now, the problem of perception is not primarily a problem about language, though I have to say in my childhood it was regarded as a problem about the understanding of verbs like see and hear and feel and touch. Uh, but I'm going to argue, in fact, that most of the problems about perception are not linguistic. Some of them are. I mean, it's a well-known fact that language alters our perception. Uh, there's a wonderful passage in Raoul Foucault where he said very few people would ever fall in love if they never read about it. And nowadays we have to say if they didn't see it on television and in the movies and so on. But the fact is there are some experiences that it's really hard to have if you haven't got a verbal framework, if you haven't got a verbal uh, expression of the feeling. So I think we're going to find that there is a role for language. Nonetheless, at the most basic level, the problems of perception are not linguistic. Well, what are they? Well, traditionally, the problem of perception was the problem of accounting for the relationship between our inner perceptual experiences and the external world. What's the relationship? between my perception, which presumably goes on in my head, my visual experience, when I see my hand in front of my face, what's the relationship between the inner experience and the hand in front of my face? Now, I think, in fact, that that problem has a fairly easy solution. And I'm going to give it to you to start with, but I have to say, here's a stunning fact. Just about all of the great philosophers deny what I think is the obviously correct account. They presented in various versions of a false account, and I'll tell you what their false account was. Now, this is desperately important in the history of philosophy. Why? Well, Descartes set philosophy off onto a new track when he made the central question of philosophy, how we can have a secure foundation for knowledge. How can we have uh, a certainty and sureness in our knowledge of the external world knowledge that was exploding in the 17th century scientific revolutions at the time that Descartes wrote. But if we're going to have knowledge, knowledge is going to depend crucially on perception. And how can we be sure that our perceptual experiences give us accurate knowledge? Now, uh, Descartes' solution to that problem is one of the most preposterous arguments in the history of philosophy, and I hope you don't have time to go into it, because I think it's a pain in the neck. But anyway, uh, what he said was, it's true that all we have to go on are these inner perceptual experiences, but they have to give us truth about the world, at least in the case of clear and distinct perceptions, because otherwise, God would have played a terrible trick on us. He would have given us these perceptions where we think we're learning about the world, and we're not learning about the world. 
So if perceptions are accurate, then God is a deceiver. But God can't be a deceiver, so perceptions, at least the clear and distinct perceptions, must be veridical, must be accurate. That's a terrible argument. I'm embarrassed to repeat it. But anyway, let's rush on from it. By the way, as I talk, if you want to ask any questions or say anything, that's fine. This is not a lecture. This is a kind of informal talk, so you can interrupt me at any point. Okay, so uh, what then, if that's the problem of perception, what's the relation between our inner perceptual experiences and the external world? Uh, what's the correct solution to it? And what are these various false solutions? And I'm just going to begin by giving you what I think is the correct uh, solution. And then I'll tell you about all the famous false solutions. And again, it is a stunning fact about the history of philosophy that none of the famous philosophers, none of the great philosophers of the modern era, by great philosophers, I mean Descartes, Locke, Berkeley, Hume, uh, Kant, Leibniz, Spinoza, and maybe we throw in the 19th century guys, uh, Hegel and John Stuart Mill, none of them uh, believed what I'm about to say. So I'm going to say it slowly and clearly because I think it's the correct account. Stimulations, uh, typically from objects and states of affairs in the world, irritate our sensory nerve endings. Uh, since most of our knowledge of the world comes from vision, I'll talk about vision because we know quite a bit about how it works in the neurobiology. Okay, photons strike the photoreceptor cells of the retina. These are the famous rods and the cones. And the signal then goes through the five layers of cells in the retina, the vertical, horizontal, amacrine, and ganglion cells. It then sets up a stimulus that goes through the optic nerve uh, until it, uh, well, it goes over the optic chiasma and eventually it reaches the lateral geniculate nucleus. I once asked a famous neurobiology, what the hell's going on in the lateral geniculate nucleus, the LGN? Don't ask, he said. We only very imperfectly understand. But anyway, the signal gets out of the LGN and goes back in the V1 of the visual cortex. Even that's kind of oversimple because there's a lot of feedback between the cortex and the LGN. And then there's all kinds of wonderful things happening. All sorts of processing takes place. And there are different parts of the cortex that are specialized for different uh, types of stimulus, uh, color and shape, for example. And this gives us a fascinating problem in neurobiology. It's called a binding problem. If you see color with one part of your brain and see shape with another part of the brain, how come it all hangs together when you just look at an object? You don't see the color over here and the shape over there. And this is called the binding problem. And I guess it gives rise to a lot of PhD theses in neurobiology. Anyway, uh, the signal goes on and then an amazing thing happens. You have a conscious visual experience. Now the question is, what is the relation of the conscious visual experience and the external world? Well, let's take an actual case. I see my hand in front of my face. When I do that, I have a conscious visual experience going on in my brain. What's the relationship between the conscious visual experience? Here's the object out here with a square hand uh, and photons uh, go off uh, of this and strike the retina and then uh, they go back uh, in the way that I tried to describe and then there is a conscious visual experience. Now, what's the relationship between this conscious visual experience and the object in the world? Now, to answer that question, I'll have to introduce the first technical term, uh, uh, maybe it's, I hope, the only technical term I'm using, and that's intentionality. It's an ugly word, uh, and like most confusing words, we got it from the Germans. Uh, the Germans don't have a problem that we have uh, for us, intentionality sounds an awful lot like intending. So people think the intentionality of perception must have something similar to intending to go to the movies. It doesn't. 
Uh, intending is just one kind of intentionality. Intentionality is the most general term for features of the mind by which they represent objects and states of affairs in the world, by which they, for example, give us information about objects and states of affairs in the world. So the uh, essence of intentionality is representation, and we can think of this, uh, we can think of intentional states like belief and desire as representations. If I believe I, that Donald Trump is president, then I have a representation of the fact that Donald Trump is president, and my belief represents that state of affairs. Now, if we can say that for any intentional state that does represent in the world that way, we can say that the representation is successful or not. In the case of beliefs, it can be true or false. In the case of desires, it can be satisfied or frustrated. In the case of intentions, it can be carried out or not carried out. And let's hear, I promise only one technical term. Here's another one, though. We can say that any intentional state is a representation of its conditions of satisfaction. So belief represents what must be the case, satisfaction, uh, or what must be the case if it's true. Uh, desire represents what must be the case if it's uh, fulfilled. Uh, and intention represents what must be the case if the intention is carried out. Okay, so we can say <coughs> that this representing phenomenon here has as, as its condition of satisfaction that there should be an object in the world. My belief that my hand is in front of my face is like my seeing that my hand is in front of my face in that both have the condition of satisfaction that my hand is in front of my face. Now, that, I, I want that to sound kind of obvious, all of that, but in fact, if you understand even that much, you're way ahead of the philosophy profession because they have problem with the idea that perceptions can be, have intentionality. They think beliefs and desires are okay, but perceptions, yes, perceptions have intentionality. What's the proof? The condition of satisfaction of my belief that my hand is in front of my face are the same as the condition of satisfaction of my seeing that my hand is in front of my face. I'll explain some differences later, but at least that much is true, and that's not a trivial point because my knowledge that my hand is in front of my face typically comes from seeing that my hand is in front of my face. The intentionality of belief depends on the intentionality of perception. Okay, now I'm now going to make it a little more complicated, but that's the bare bones. Everybody with us, I want this to sound. I once gave, a, I taught a course at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And the kids complain, why is it all kind of obvious? You know, this is, why aren't you telling us something exciting about the onset of post-industrial man under late capitalism or something like that? But all this stuff about intention and intentionality and conditional satisfaction, it's kind of easy. Well, in fact, what I've just told you is in various ways denied by the entire uh, philosophical uh, profession, beginning from Descartes right up through the well, right up through the mid-20th century, and I don't know how many people accept this, I think it's kind of obviously right, but I'm now going to make it a little more complicated by introducing uh, some uh, complexities to the story that I've given you. The basic point that I want you to get across is to see that the key to understanding perception is intentionality. And that perception gives you access to the conditions of satisfaction. We're going to make it a little more complicated, but that's the basic idea. Question. Somebody a hand up. Okay. Yeah. Um, so is the intentionality of belief, is that, can that be likened to the sort of correspondence? I'm not hearing you, but I'm pretty much stunned deaf. So, uh, so the intentionality of belief, is that sort of related to the correspondence between the belief and the state of affairs in the yes. external world? The intentionality of belief consists in the fact that a belief represents a state of affairs. It represents the state of affairs which must exist if the belief is to be true. So beliefs can be true or false. 
Desires, on the, hand, on the other hand, cannot be pure false. They can be uh, uh, satisfied or frustrated. So the belief has one uh, uh, has a set of conditions of satisfaction, and desire also has conditions of satisfaction. Now I'm going to introduce, introduce another notion here, which is crucial, and that is the notion of direction of fit. Beliefs are supposed to represent how things are in the world, and they have what I call the mind-to-world direction of fit. The mind is supposed to represent reality. But desires are not supposed to represent how things are, but how we'd like them to be. And if you think of the world down here as, and the mind up here, then desires have the world-to-mind direction of fit. Uh, if the desire is satisfied, the world comes to be in such a way that the desire represents its being satisfied. Uh, that is, in each the belief and the desire, there is a, a, a condition of satisfaction, but the direction of fit is different. Does everybody see that? The for, beliefs are supposed to match how the world is. The mind is supposed to fit the world. Desires are not supposed to represent how the world is, but how we'd like it to be. So we have the world to mind direction of fit, not the mind to world direction of fit. Okay, uh, everybody help with us. Any other question at this point? Okay, now let's introduce a little more complexity. In the case of perception, we have the mind-to-world direction of fit. In the case of desire, we have the world-to-mind direction of fit. But there is a distinction between perceptions and, for example, beliefs and desires, in that the perception gives you direct and immediate access to the condition of satisfaction. You see the hand right there in front of your face. It's not like closing your eyes and believing that there's a hand in front of your face. And I want to say, it's not just a representation, it's a direct presentation of the condition of satisfaction. And this is shown by the fact that there, that there is this immediacy to the relation of the perception and the condition of satisfaction. You see the object right smack in front of your face. The condition of satisfaction are directly presented by the intentionality of perception. It's not just a representation. It's a direct presentation of the condition of satisfaction. Uh, and memory is kind of an intermediate case because in memory you have a representation, but you also have what we have in perception, a causal condition. In the case of perception, unlike belief, the perception is satisfied, that is, it's true or veridical, only if the object that I'm seeing causes me to have that very perception. There is a causal relation between the condition of satisfaction in the case of perception, which does not exist in the case of belief. And we can say that the conditions of satisfaction are such that the belief is satisfied, uh, that the perception is satisfied only if the perception itself is caused by the conditions of satisfaction. There is a causal condition in the conditions of satisfaction of the perception that is not present in the case of belief. Uh, if I believe uh, that um, uh, uh, Donald Trump uh, is uh, sleeping right now, then that belief can be true even if his sleeping didn't cause uh, the uh, uh, the, perce the belief, but if I can, if I see him lying on a couch, then his my seeing that he's lying on the couch, that visual experience is satisfied only if the fact that he is lying on the couch causes the very visual experience of seeing that is on the that he's lying on the couch. So the condition of satisfaction have a causal condition. But the causal condition refers to the very intentional state itself. If I see my hand in front of my face, then the fact that the hand is in front of my face 
must cause the very visual experience whose conditions of satisfaction are that my hand is in front of my face. So we can say that the conditions of satisfaction are causally self-referential because they refer to the very intentional state and the state of affairs that is the condition of satisfaction of that intentional state. In the case of perception, the intentionality is satisfied only if the fact that you are perceiving causes a very visual experience that constitutes the perception of it. Now, if you got that, you're way ahead of 300 years past 300 years of philosophy, so let's stop and catch our breath. Now, why couldn't all these guys say that? Locke, Barclay, Hume, Descartes, Leibniz, Spinoza, and Old Uncle Tom Cobbley, and all. Why couldn't they say these obvious facts? And the answer is because they did not have a theory of the intentionality of perception. They had a totally misconceived conception of the relationship between perception and the external world. And I'm going to tell you what that conception was. But first, I want you to get the truth because the falsehoods only interesting to you if you can see them against the background of what I think is the true account. The true, according to the true account, in perception, we have a direct presentation of objects and states of affairs in the world. That presentation is intentional, but it is different from the intentionality of belief and desire because that intentionality is representational, not presentational. And the presentational intentionality has a causally self-reflexive condition in that the intentional state is satisfied only if the state of affairs that you are perceiving causes the very perception that has those conditions of satisfaction. I see my hand in front of my face only if the fact that my hand is in front of my face causes the experience that constitutes seeing that my hand is in front of my face. I hope I said that right, but let's take more questions. Yeah. So the fact then has something to do with the immediacy? The of fact that you are directly presented with the conditions of satisfaction makes it presentation. Makes it a presentation and not a representation. See, close your eyes and imagine that your hand is in front of my face. I remember, I remember or remember that it was in front of your face yesterday. Those are representations. The presentation has this direct immediacy, and so that's why you perceive things. Your perception is as if you were in direct contact with the object perceived. And that is even, and that's true even in cases where you know it's not, where you know it's a hallucination, or you know there's, that it's a long time ago. You know that the star that you're seeing ceased to exist a million years ago, even though you're seeing it today. You're seeing it as if it were right here now, because that's what evolution has given us in the way of perceptual apparatus, is a sense of being in direct causal and intentional contact with reality, and that's what makes perception so powerful. Okay, any other questions? Because this is crucial. I want everybody to understand this. So we've got the following features of perception then. You have the downhill or mind-to-world direction of fit. It's presentational rather than representational and it has the condition of satisfaction are such that the existence of those conditions must cause the visual experience or else it's not satisfied. So let's uh, put the different difference this way. Let's take a belief, the belief that my hand is in front of my face. Well, it's just the belief condition of satisfaction is that the hand is there. It's right there in front of my face. But the visual experience is more complicated. Is the hand is there and the fact that the hand is there, is causing this visual experience. And that's why you get this causal self-referentiality that I was talking about. The visual experience in its condition of satisfaction refers to itself 
because it says the visual experience must be caused by the very state of affairs that you are seeing, must be caused by the object and state of affairs in the world that constitutes the condition of satisfaction. And it's part of the condition of satisfaction that that causal relation obtains. See, the intentional state consists of a type, belief, and a representation of the condition of satisfaction. But in the case of the visual experience, you've got a direct presentation of the condition of satisfaction, and you experience the visual experience as directly giving you access to reality, even in cases where you know what it is not in fact. Seeing the star there is exactly as if it were present to you right now, even though it ceased to exist, even though you might know that it ceased to exist a million years ago. Okay, yeah. So uh, would you say that um, in order to have a theoretical experience, it has to be an object in the world that is causing the visual experience? Yes. But it's, it's also, does it also mean that you experience it as cause? I think you experience it as cause, okay, absolutely. Okay. And I think that our, let me see, <laughs> uh, one of the great philosophers of all time, in particular the greatest English language philosopher, was David Hume. David Hume says we never experience causation. Yeah. Now that's not just a little bit mistaken, it's pretty much 100% mistaken. <laughs> we always experience causation. I can't raise my arm without experience causation. I can't see this uh, object in front of me without experience causation. And I'm now going to do something truly spectacular. I'm going to cause myself to ingest water by having an intentional act of drinking. So I think causation is everywhere and we experience it pretty much all the time. This table is held together by weak and strong nuclear forces. That's all causal. When I lean against it, I experience it causing a pressure in my hand and causing me to not fall over by supporting my weight. So I think, contrary to Hume, who says we never experience causation, I think we experience it pretty much all of our waking life. It's always there. Yeah? So how is it possible to distinguish between uh, the belief that there's an object in the external world? I have the equation on the okay. Go ahead. How, how do we distinguish between the belief that there's an object in the external world and the fact that it's actually there? Yeah. Okay. You have beliefs, they represent states of affairs in the world. The belief will be true if and only if the state of affairs that it represents actually exists. Now the belief, however, is different from the memory or the perception in that the belief can be true even though it wasn't caused by the state of affairs that the belief is about. But if you remember going on a picnic yesterday then your memory is accurate only if the fact that you went on a picnic yesterday causes you to have that very memory. Memory is causally self reflexive like perception. And similarly, I see this object in front of my face only if the fact that the object is there is causing this visual experience. If you could prove that the visual experience was caused by something else, then you can show that I didn't actually see it. I mean, to actually see it, the State of affairs that you're seeing must cause the visual experience. Okay, now I want to say a little bit more about how it actually works, but I want to tell you what the tradition says. Now, the view that I have been given, whereby this guy here causes this object there, this is supposed to be a causal relation, and in addition to the causal relation, there's an intentional relation whereby his visual experience presents the object uh, that you are actually seeing. I, that view, I think, is the correct view. But the view that we've all inherited, and it's amazing how many smart people believe this, is you never actually see objects out here. What you see is ideas in here. Mm -hmm. And there are so many bad arguments for this that I could spend the rest of the morning going over them, but let me just give you the two most famous bad arguments for this view. Uh, by the way, uh, everybody likes jargons. The view that I've given you is called perceptual realism 
or sometimes by people who like to sneer at it, it's called naive realism. I think that's a real world, and we do actually perceive it. Okay, so it's naive realism. The view that I'm opposed to is you never actually perceive objects and states of affairs. What you actually perceive are experiences in your head. Okay, what are the arguments for that? Here's the first argument, the first most famous argument called the argument from illusion. Lots of different variations, but the most obvious variation is hallucination. And here it goes. Okay, the guy says, here you are, this is you. And you think you're seeing this object out there, but suppose it's a hallucination. Now the hallucination can be exactly as if you were seeing the object, but you're not. What are you seeing in the case of hallucination? By the way, a visitor from Mars would think, who you know, studied philosophy in our universities, would think hallucinations must be very common because philosophers talk about them all the time. <laughs> I've never had a hallucination in my life. Even when drunk, I feel like I must be drinking the wrong stuff because I don't, I never have seen pink elephants or whatever you're supposed to see uh, when you get drunk. Um, but uh, I've never had a hallucination. But anyway, they do exist, so let's uh, uh, describe what goes on in the case of hallucination. Here's how the argument goes. In the case of hallucination, the experience that you have here is exactly the same as, as it is in the veridical case. But you don't actually see an object in the world because it's just a hallucination. You don't have that stuff there, you just have this stuff in here. Now, what do you see then? The visual experience is exactly the same, that's why you can be deceived by a hallucination. Well, the story goes, you don't see a real hand, you see the appearance of a hand, or a hallucinatory hand, or the image of a hand. But, now the story goes, we ought to get a name for those images, appearances, and so on. And the traditional name in the history of philosophy was ideas, but they have in the past hundred years come to be called sense data. You don't perceive objects in the world, you perceive sense data. And the proof is that the experience is exactly the same in the hallucination case and in the vertical case, but in the hallucination case, you don't see an object, but you do see something. I mean, the experience is exactly the same. So we need a name for these somethings, call them sense data, and then the argument goes, you see sense data, but not objects in the world. And the question then is, well, uh, what's the relationship between the sense data that you do see and the object that you don't see. And all of the famous philosophers had various bad answers to that question. And I'm going to tell you what they are. I'm embarrassed that all these smart guys believe something so obviously false, but here's how it goes. Descartes and Locke said, okay, you don't see the object, you see this thing here. But the, the thing here is a kind of picture or representation of the object, and so you can find out about the object by seeing this thing here, because the, the thing here gives you kind of picture of the object. The object resembles the sense data in certain respects. And then there's a fancy theory about primary and secondary qualities, strictly speaking, for, for uh, Locke and Descartes, the object resembles the sense datum only with respect to the primary qualities, not with respect to the secondary color, qualities like color, taste, and smell, because they are really systematic illusions. Objects aren't really colored, but they give us the illusion that they're colored by giving us these experiences. But they really do have a shape, and the shape of the visual experience really does resemble the shape of the object. So the story goes, you don't see the object, you see the idea, 
but the idea gives you knowledge of the object because the object resembles the idea in certain respects, namely with respect to the primary qualities. Uh, if you've ever read any of these guys, you're familiar with it. This is Locke, and explicitly in a lot of detail in Locke and Descartes, it's not so much spelled out, but it's there if you look closely. There's a, a, a representative theory of perception. And this theory is called a representative theory. You don't see objects in the world, you just see your own experiences, but that's okay, because the, your own experiences give you kind of movie. They give you a representation of objects in the world, so you can get information about objects in the world from watching the movie in here. You're always watching a movie in here, but it gives you knowledge of what's going on in the world, because the movie actually represents things going on in the world, and the way it represents is by resemblance the experience of the primary qualities actually resembles primary qualities of actual objects. That's the story of the representative theory of perception. Everybody got that? It's hard to believe that smart people believe this, but a lot of them did, and a lot still do. I'll tell you some of them. Uh, so, okay, that's the representative theory of perception. Now, a f famous philosopher who was not a great genius like uh, uh, Descartes or Kant, but he was pretty smart. Uh, he looked at this picture when he was about, well, he was really just a teenager. He was uh, 15 when he wrote his first work on perception, and this town is named after him, uh, Bishop Barclay. Now, uh, if his name is pronounced Barclay, the way the English would pronounce it, we have been systematically mispronouncing it. But he was, in fact, Irish, and I don't know how the Irish pronounce his name. So anyway, I'll call him Berkeley, and I'll call the town Berkeley. But anyway, the town was, was named after this guy. He looked at this picture. You see this, and it resembles that. But he thought, that makes no sense at all. Because my hand, which I have an experience here, this experience is of something visible. Whatever it is that I'm seeing, it's something visible. But this out here is totally invisible. You can't see this. So how can it look like that? I mean, suppose a guy says, I've got two cars in my garage that look exactly like, but the one on the left is totally invisible. That's crazy. Well, but this is what the representative theory of perception says. It says the idea resembles the object, but the object is totally invisible. You can't see the object. Okay, Barclay saw that when he was just a kid. He saw the notion of representation makes no sense because representation requires resemblance and there's no way a visible idea can uh, resemble something totally invisible. And on the representative theory, the real world itself is totally invisible. Okay, then came one of the great disasters in the history of philosophy. What Berkeley should have said is, well, I guess naive realism was right all along. That's not what he said. What he said is, let's just get rid of all of this. Then what's left is ideas and minds. And in fact, you can't even say that the head is left because, of course, the head just consists of ideas and what you actually perceive. Here's your mind, and you perceive ideas in your mind, and that's all that exists. The only things that exist in the entire universe are minds and ideas. Now, I'm embarrassed when I teach my students to tell them that smart guys believe this because I think it's absolutely bonkers, but it is uh, a view that is famous in the history of philosophy. It is typically called idealism, uh, not because these guys had such high ideals, but because that's all that reality consisted in, was ideas. The world consists in ideas. As John Stuart Mill said, when an object just is a permanent possibility of sensation. When, when you buy a piece of real estate, you're not buying an actual object in the world. What you're buying is a permanent possibility of sense data. You can go have sense data of your uh, house anytime you want, 
uh, but that's all there is in the world are minds and ideas. So that view has a name uh, in the uh, German tradition, and that's the tradition of Hegel and all those guys. It's called idealism, and in our tradition, it's typically called phenomenalism because it says the only things that actually exist are the phenomena of perception. That's phenomenalism. And I, I, they, they went in different directions, phenomenalism and idealism. Phenomenalism was more tied to science, and the idea was that, well, that's really what science gives us, is uh, a uh, set of devices for predicting sense data, a set of devices for predicting phenomena. Whereas the uh, Hegelian tradition really went off the deep end and said, that's all there is. Reality consists in ideas, and all that really exists in the world is a sequence of mental phenomena. The world is at bottom totally mental. I find it hard to get in. I, I mean, uh, most crazy views in philosophy, I kind of kind of imagine what it's like to believe that. I can't imagine what it would be like to be an idealist, to think all that really exists is uh, experiences, is sets of uh, states of consciousness. That the world reduces to states of consciousness seems to me so crazy, I can't imagine anybody believing that. But an awful lot of smart people believe that. In fact, one of the most amazing things in the history of philosophy is the persistence of idealism right up into the 20th century. Uh, and in fact, the worst form, well, I shouldn't really say that because I can't actually read it. I was going to say the worst form is Hegelian idealism. But who the hell knows what Hegel was trying to say? <laughs> it's unreadable. Uh, if any of you can read it, I'll give you a medal. But you know, <laughs> I've tried, and it's not worth the effort. Uh, OK. So what comes out at the bottom line, or so I'm arguing, is that uh, naive realism uh, has the view that we're in direct perceptual content, contact with the world, and now we have various accounts for various things, uh, such as hallucination. But, the, uh, but roughly speaking, none of the great philosophers were naive realists. Now I shouldn't say that because I never read all these guys. I mean, maybe Thomas Reed was a naive realist. I don't know. He wasn't that important when I studied the history of philosophy. But the great thinkers in the history of philosophy all denied naive realism. And they went in one of two directions. They went with like Descartes and Locke toward the representative theory of perception. Uh, or uh, like uh, uh, Hume and Kant and Hegel, uh, they went for idealism or phenomenalism. Hume is is uh, uh, fascinating because he was very smart and he worked out the, uh, the consequences of the assumptions that he was making to the limit and he saw that phenomenalism has to be right. But he also thought it's unbelievable. Nobody can believe uh, that the object doesn't really exist. So says Hume, well, Barclay was right, but you can't believe it. What is it that we believe instead? Well, believe, we believe that ideas have a continued and distinct existence. That is, that they exist even when we're not uh, perceiving them, and that they have a, an existence distinct from our perception of them. Now, that's the dumbest thing in the history, to believe that this could exist even if nobody was perceiving it, but we believe it. We believe that this has a continuous and distinct existence. So Hume then has a very elaborate argument as to how we come by this crazy view that objects exist distinct from our perception of them and uh, continuous even when we're not perceiving them. Uh, Barclay would have thought that crazy, but that's what we do believe. Hume thinks, uh, Barclay, uh, on Hume's view, Barclay's right, but nobody can believe it, so I'll tell you why you believe uh, something false, why you can't help but believe something false. I mean, I know what reason, the, Reading the history of philosophy usually gives me a stomachache, but this is one of the reasons why, is that these guys are very smart guys, but they all held, I think, absurdly false views. So, in the account that I'm giving you, you get a choice between naive realism, and I'll draw you pictures of these. The naive realist says, perception gives you direct 
access to the object. That's the nine realist view, and you have in here a perceptual experience of the object. The phenomenalist says all you perceive is what's in here, there's nothing else. And the representative theorist says you do perceive this, but this is a kind of picture of that. So you get three possible views. You get the naive realist view that says you directly perceive objects, and in so doing, you have an experience in your head. The a phenomenalist says there aren't any objects except the, these perceptions. That's really all there is to the reality. To reality is ideas, and that's idealism or phenomenalism. The representative theorist says what you get are pictures of the real world, and they give you representations. Now, I think that, uh, that um, Hume and Barclay refuted the representative theory, but it's still around. I mean, uh, Francis Crick believed that all we perceive are our own uh, sense data, and he thought that he could show that with neurobiology, and, but that um, we believe that our uh, perceptions correspond to something in the world. And I guess that's a kind of version of the, of the representative theory of perception. Now, Francis was a smart guy, but don't talk to him about philosophy because he was very confused. Uh, and he, but his conception was that w there is a homunculus. I haven't talked about the homunculus. You know, homunculus just means the little guy. And one of the false theories of perception, but it's easy to see how you're tempted to it if you buy the representative theory is that there, in your head there's a little guy and he does all the seeing. There's a, there's, a, there's a TV set and he's watching the TV set. But if our perception consists of a little guy in the head watching the TV set, then what does the little guy in the head perception consist in? And it looks like you get an infinite regress. You've got to have a, a little guy in the head of a little guy and so on, as they say, down the line. Uh, so there, uh, I mean, one of the things that makes philosophy fun is there are so many false views you can refute. And I think in the case of, of the uh, visual experience, uh, the truth is not hard to state. Uh, you have direct perceptual access to objects and states of affairs in the world, uh, and you then get direct knowledge of them by having perceptual experiences of them. Uh, the key to understanding perception is intentionality but the intentionality of perception is presentational and not representational, and it has this causally self-reflexive feature. The intentional state is satisfied only if the thing you're seeing causes the intentional state. Yes? <coughs> so in the case of Kant, would he be your represent, or would well, he Well, okay, I was afraid somebody would ask about Kant. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I can draw a picture of anybody on the blackboard, but how the hell do you draw a picture of the ding on the safe? Uh, well, but let me tell you about it. I mean, of these guys, Kant was the smartest. <coughs> hey, it drives me crazy, actually. I decided we got to master this goddamn book. We've got somebody who's familiar with real philosophy who ought to get to the bottom of it. So I went to work on the critique of pure reason. I did it in English, cheating, I'm sure, but anyway, I did it in English. And my wife couldn't believe it because she thinks that she thought I had a concentration span of about 10 minutes, and that's probably exaggerating. But when it came to the critique, I just did something wrong. That's what it's got in book. And I wrote a summary of the whole goddamn book. And then I thought I'd rewrite the way a real philosopher should have written it. I didn't do the rewrite part, but I did write a summary of the whole book because uh, I got so obsessed with it. Now, his theory goes something like this. You can't draw a picture of it on the blackboard. In addition to our experiences, there are things in themselves. There are objects in themselves. Uh, the singular is ding on zik. There are a uh, thing, there is a thing in itself when I see my hand. Now the problem about the thing in itself is not only can you not see it, you can't even meaningfully talk about it because you have no perceptual access to it at all. Well, why the hell do you suppose it must exist? There must be something that makes our knowledge objective. So if I talk about this chair, and you talk about this chair, though all I can see are my own sense data, and all you can see are your sense data, all the same, there has to be some reality out there which underlies the sense data. 
right? I'm not just talking about my own private experiences when I talk about the table. I'm talking about an objective reality. In order that there can be an objective reality and hence objective knowledge. See, without an objective reality, there's no objective knowledge. In order that there can be objective knowledge, there must be things in themselves. There must be a thing on sea. But you can't meaningfully talk about it the thing in itself uh, because it's totally inaccessible to your cognitive apparatus. It isn't just you can't see it, you can't even meaningfully talk about it. Now he cheats a bit because he does say things about it which on his own account you can't say because these are terms from our actual experiences of what, what he calls the phenomenal world and consequently, they don't apply to things in themselves. He says, the thing in itself provides the ground, the grunt of our knowledge, of our objective knowledge. But on his own account, he can't say that, because grunt, that's a word of German, like any other word, and there's no way those words can apply to things in themselves. So we have to suppose that there is a reality of things in themselves but we can't even talk about it meaningfully because we have no access to it cognitively. It isn't just you can't see it. You can't even think about it meaningfully because you have no way to hook your thoughts on to the real things. So we're in the odd situation where in order to account for objective knowledge, we have to suppose a world of things in themselves but the world of things in themselves is totally inaccessible. We can't, not only can we not perceive them, we can't even meaningfully think or talk about them. Whereupon he then proceeds to start thinking and talking about them, which is exasperating. But in any case, he does say things on which on his own account he's not allowed to say, such as they provide the grunt, the ground of our objective knowledge. But grunt is a word of common language. It's a word describing actual states of affairs, and no such words can describe things in themselves. Okay, I think you want to take a break now, right? Yes, uh, so we continue then, or? I don't know, we have minutes, but I think we are ready to continue. Okay. Right? Maybe just ask for one particular question? Yeah. When you say that memory is an intermediate case, yeah. would you say that memory is a belief about perception? Well, it needn't be about perception, uh, because you can invent memories not involving perception. You can remember the time that you were depressed or something like that. But memory is a representation of past, I'm talking about event memory, there are lots of different kinds of memory. I like my um, ability to remember how to speak French. Uh, but event memory yeah, is a case where you have an intentional representation of events that occurred in your past and the condition of satisfaction is the event has to actually have occurred and has to cause your present memory of it. So you get to cause the self-reflexive feature, but it's not presentational because the memory does not give you direct presentation of the past. Yeah. So uh, be, um, before we started with this talk, we were watching a video yeah. on uh, how some neuroscientists interpret um, Perception and actually it was I don't know if you've seen it by um, what's his name David David Eagleman yeah. who worked uh, with uh, Francis yeah. right? and all you know I wanted them to say because the whole you know rationale and the whole argument was like we don't perceive reality the way yeah. it is we just perceive what's in our heads yeah. we create our own reality yeah. and That's it wrong. seems that we should believe that because now they have all these evidence of, you know, what's going on in the retina, how that information gets, you know, yeah. like carried around, you know, the different nervous well, system and intuition and so on. So, yeah. so well, the, I, know, I know it's part of the Bible argument, but can you spell it out? Sorry? I know it's part of the Bible argument, but how yeah. okay. well, let's go you through it. say about that? Um, here is the, what I think is the correct view. Uh, there is an object in the world and we have our perceptual apparatus and the object impacts on our perceptual apparatus and causes a visual experience which has 
of the object as its condition of satisfaction. That, I think, is a correct view. Now, there is a view uh, that says uh, you can never see objects. You only see these things in here. And I gave you the one, uh, the most famous argument for that is the argument for the illusion of which the simplest version is the hallucination. And the story goes, well, suppose this hallucination, you do see something, but you don't see that, so you see what's in here. But there is another argument, which in a way is more influential nowadays because of the prestige of the natural sciences, and that argument goes, science has proven that you don't see objects and states of affairs in the world. All that you can ever see is the imagery in your own head. And what is the proof? The proof is that if you actually trace Oh, the damn thing keeps going. <laughs> I'll just stick it in my ear. Um, the, uh, the proof is that the actual processes going on are such that when this, when these photons hit the photoreceptor cells, there is that sequence that described uh, that I described to you, whereby it causes a visual experience. But now, so the story goes, what do you actually see? Well, the only thing you can see is the visual experience here. That seems to me a mistake because what it confuses explaining how we see, how we see that is that it causes a visual experience in us that has its presence as conditions of satisfaction. It causes intentionality. But Francis Crick uh, didn't see that. I'm, I'm not sure Jerry Edelman did or not, but and these guys were good friends of mine. Uh, but in Francis's case, there's no question. He thought all you can see is what's going on in your head, and science has shown that. Now, I want to say science didn't show that at all. What science shows is how it works when you see something in the world, and the way it works is that the something in the world causes you to have the visual experience. Now this is why the pathological cases are so interesting to us. In the case of what's called blind sight, uh, the patient reports a visual experience, but reports, rep reports what's going on in the world, but reports no visual experience. Does everybody know about this? There are patients that who have damages uh, to their neurobiology, and the upshot is that they can tell you what's going on in the world, and you can even get a guy to follow by a, a light on a screen, but he can't see it. He doesn't actually see it. Uh, what he uh, reports is what's happening in the world, and he reports that on the basis of visual experience, but he has no conscious awareness. Now, what does that show? Well, I think what, it, what most people think it shows is that there are more, there's more than one visual system in the brain and not all of them are conscious. Uh, some of the visual systems in the brain give you unconscious intentionality. Uh, I think from my point of view, what it shows is that there can be forms of intentionality, visual forms of intentionality, without a conscious visual experience. Because you have visual intentionality here. The guy says there's something going on there even though I can't see it. What's interesting about these cases, called blind sight, is if you ask the guy, well, what did you see? He says, I didn't see anything. Couldn't see a damn thing. Well, how did you know? I don't know. I just said, what's this? what it seemed like. It seemed like uh, there was a light moving on the screen. Uh, and that's it. Um, and anyway, there are, there are uh, good books about this. There are, there are, what's the guy's name who discovered blind sight? I've forgotten his name. Um, anyway, look, he invented the term blind sight. God, I know the guy. He's a good friend of mine. This is a terrible thing about old age. Uh, the guy was an American uh, teaching psychology in Oxford, and he uh, discovered uh, that for a long, a long time they had a single patient. They had a patient who was in a car accident at the age of 10, and the, uh, it's a too horrible experience, but the car ran over the visual, uh, uh, ran over the V17, uh, and, and the guy could then report things going on. He was blind, not in the whole visual field, but in a certain portion of the visual field. So for example, if you think of the visual field as having a kind of oval shape, uh, the guy was blind down here. He couldn't see anything there, but he could see stuff here. 
And if you got him to say, well, what does it seem like? First, initially, these guys are annoyed. They say, you know, I've got to, I was in a car accident. I can't see anything there. There. What do you mean? What does it seem like? Well, what does it seem like? Well, it seems like there's an X there, or it seems like there's an O. And they would shine an X or an O. Yeah. The way the experiment works is you tell a guy, focus your eye on this point where these two lines cross, and he would focus. Then you shine an X or an O very rapidly, so fast that he can't shift his uh, gaze away from the center point. And then you ask him, what did you see? The guy's annoyed. He said, I didn't see anything. His name was Weisskranz. I knew it would come back to me. Larry Weisskranz. Uh, and uh, Weisskranz discovered this one guy uh, who could report X's and O's even though he reported no visual experience of them. Now for a long time they only had one subject and that guy was pretty popular with psychology graduate students. They would follow him around. Now they have a lot. Now there are a whole lot of uh, blind sight patients. And they've done something I think ought not to be allowed, and that is they've induced blind sight into monkeys by damaging a certain portion of the visual cortex. Uh, but in any case, in the case of blind sight, you have, from my point of view, what's important is you have perceptual intentionality without a, a perceptual experience. They have forms where the guy has some kind of knowledge of what's happening, but there's no perceptual experience. And as I said, when you ask a guy, well, how did you know? Typically, they don't, they can't answer that and they get annoyed at the question. Anyway, look up Larry Weisskranz in the library. That's what I did. And his first book gives a very good description of these cases. Okay, other, yeah. Um, so for a recent seminar, uh, I read an excerpt of your work on consciousness. And um, my question is, in terms of intentionality, you said that there are certain states of consciousness, like anxiety, that are undirected, you yeah. have no object? There are forms of consciousness that lack intentionality. Is, is that uh, really possible? Form, is, there are forms of nervousness and anxiety where the patient can't answer the question, well, what are you anxious about? What are you nervous about? And the answer is, I'm just nervous. I'm just, I'm in a state of anxiety, but I'm not anxious about anything. So there are forms of consciousness that are not intentional. And uh, direct, undirected anxiety is a case of that, where the guy is anxious, but he doesn't, he's not anxious about anything in particular, he's just anxious. Now I once lectured to an audience of psychoanalysts, and they said, our job is to find out what he's really anxious about, because we don't think you can really uh, have anxiety without it being directed. Uh, there, so uh, that's, but that's a scientific, I mean, that's an empirical hypothesis. The hypothesis that all of these cases under psychoanalysis would reveal the intentional object. But that's, I don't know about that. But as far as I'm concerned, the concept of intention, of uh, uh, consciousness does not require intentionality. There are forms of consciousness without intentionality, then there are forms of, obviously, forms of intentionality that are unconscious, where you're not conscious of what it is that's worrying you, but, but uh, you are worried. Okay, any other, yeah? You know, when you mention terms like sense data and yeah. describe representationalism, where you're thinking of a picture in your head, not the actual yeah. item, it kind of made me think of computer scientists. Yeah. And do you think that computer scientists in general fall in that representational camp, and as a result, does that make it easier for them to build a model of human cognition that they then could backtrack and say, well, AI is gonna mimic yeah. human cognition, because we've defined it basically in computer science terms. Okay. It feels like a little bit of a circular argument. Well, right this now. is a, a very important issue in contemporary intellectual life. Uh, if you think that the brain is a digital computer, then you're going to think that the brain is busy solving computational problems. Uh, and that perception consists of the solution to computational problems. Now, I think sometimes the brain does solve computational problems. I have to work on my income tax this afternoon, and there are a lot of tiresome computational problems that I don't even, I don't even want to think about. It. Um, but there are lots of times when you just do something. Things just happen to you, and there's no... Uh, there's no set of computational steps. Now this is why, in a way, early days of AI were so frustrating, 
because they wanted a computational solution to problems that were not computational. And the guy who showed this, I thought convincingly, but I didn't convince the profession, was Bert Dreyfus, my colleague in philosophy. And he thought, a lot of the times you just take in a scene. You don't compute uh, the features of the scene. It's just those chairs at the back look further away than these chairs in front. It isn't that I compute from the relative size on my retina of the image. It's just they look smaller at the back of the room than they do at the front of the room. There are no set of computational steps involved. And, I, and what Burke did was get uh, chess players, and what he found was they tend to perceive recurring patterns on the board. Uh, they don't compute the position of the, of, of the queen and all of the possible other computations that you can make. So this is an issue that goes on in psychology. The temptation in cognitive psychology in the early days, uh, and this, a lot of this was going on in Berkeley, was to think uh, the brain is essentially a digital computer and the problems that it solves are essentially computational. Now, the problem with that, there was a fairly decisive argument, uh, and that was the 100-step argument. Uh, and the, um, here, I don't know if you were interested in this kind of crap, but it's sort of history now, but here's how it went. If you think that in order for me uh, uh, to recognize you as a human being and this as a chair, I must solve a computational problem, well, the problem is I recognize you as a human being in less than a half a second. I mean, it's a tiny amount. Now, uh, the difficulty is that if I think of that as a computational problem, the brain can't do much computation in half a second. The most it could do would be 100 steps, let's say. This was something that's called a 100 step argument. Um, uh, in a half a second, the brain might do 100 steps. But what a computer would have to do to recognize you as a human being would take thousands of steps. And this is why the brain couldn't be a computer, because it's too slow. Uh, the way the brain works is much too slow. Now, I think that this is a pretty good argument as it stands, but the difficulty is it neglects something important, namely the conscious experience of perception, the conscious experience of acting. All of these uh, have to be taken on their own uh, basis, and the difficulty with cognitive science in the early days is it had nothing to say about consciousness. It was all about how the brain is a computational mechanism doing various computational steps, and the 100-step argument I thought was decisive against that, that in the time allotted to the brain to recognize objects and states of affairs, it couldn't do the computations necessary because it's too slow. The brain is actually a fairly slow mechanism, but it uh, works incredibly efficiently with consciousness. You take in a whole scene. I recognize the relative position of all the people in the room and the fact that there are chairs and, and uh, tables and other objects in the room. I do all that in a fraction of a second without going through a lot of computational steps. Now, this was very important in the early days of cognitive science. Now, I haven't followed cognitive science recently, but in the early days, when we first got it going in, 19, in the 1980s in uh, Berkeley, the, the uh, paradigm in cognitive science was computationalism. I don't know what's happened since. I haven't kept uh, uh, track, but, but I think they got out of the computational obsession. The temptation with the brain is always to fix on the latest technology. So when I was a kid, uh, we were told the brain has a telephone crossbar system, because that was the latest technology. <laughs> and, and I found a 19th century uh, 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 thinker, very smart guys, who said, the brain is a telegraph system. And earlier in the 19th century, people said, the brain is a jacquard loom. A jacquard loom, apparently, was a pretty high-tech kind of thing. And it goes back to the Greeks, uh, some of whom said, the brain is really like a slingshot. It's really, uh, it's really a projectile device. So people always pick the latest technology because they don't know how the hell the thing works. Uh, we're making progress, but progress is pretty slow because you've got 100 billion neurons all crammed together in a size smaller than a basketball. 
And of course, really where the action is, is not in the neurons, but in the synapses, well, you got more synapses than you can count. So we still don't understand how the brain works, and perhaps we never will, maybe it's too hard, but, we're, but I think it was a mistake to think the right way to understand the brain is uh, as a digital computer, and I think we've overcome that. There's no, you don't get that mistake much anymore. However, you review a book two years ago for the New what? York. You review a book uh, two years ago for the New York uh, Review of Books. Did I? Okay, so I was hoping you would remember. <laughs> no. Well, do you remember the title of the book? Uh, no, sorry. All right. So but it was, it was, was in combat. I was surprised that someone will uh, publish a book on, you know, defending some sort of a strong AI. Yeah, well, you know, how many times you have to repeat, repeat, refute these guys? I, I distinguish in artificial intelligence what I call weak AI and strong AI. Weak AI says that uh, the computer is a useful device for studying the brain. And I think that's obviously right. The computer is a useful device for studying weather. In Cal Northern California, you couldn't do the weather prediction without a computer. But the, a much stronger view is no. It isn't that the brain is, it, that the computer is a useful device for studying uh, uh, the brain, but the brain is literally a digital computer, and that is the brain operations consist entirely of computational operation. Now, I refuted that, God, I don't know how many years ago, with a very simple argument, and that is, let me be the computer and uh, see if I have cognition just on the basis of computation. An example I gave was uh, Chinese. Uh, <clears throat> if you ask me a question in English, I can answer the question in English because I understand English. If you ask me a question in Chinese, I can't answer the question because I don't understand Chinese. But imagine that I am a computer, that I'm locked in a room, and in the room I have boxes full of Chinese symbols, and I have a window, and in the window comes a little bunch of Chinese symbols, unknown to me, that's called a question. And I look up in the rule book, that's called a computer program, what I'm supposed to do, and then I give back Chinese symbols in response to the questions coming in. What I give back are called answers to the questions. So if I get the picture, I'm in this dumb room, boxes of Chinese symbols, little bunches come in, those are questions. I don't know that, I just look up what I'm supposed to do with the questions, and then after a while I give back some answers because I follow the computational steps. Now, the point I made was, all the same, even though they get so good at programming me, at writing a rule book, and I get so good at shuffling the symbols, that my answers are as good as a native Chinese speaker. All the same, I don't understand a word of Chinese. And there's no way that I could understand Chinese on the basis of doing these computational operations, because I'm just a computer. I'm just doing what computers do, shuffling meaningless symbols. That's what computers do. And the symbols by themselves don't carry any meaning. When I understand English, I don't just have the symbols, I know what they mean. But when I do the Chinese in the Chinese room, I'm just a computer. I'm just shuffling the syntax with no meaning. And this is a, an argument that has steps, and I like arguments that have steps, and I won't write it on the blackboard, but here's how it goes. Computers are syntactical. They operate with syntax. But actual human cognition requires semantics. You have to have something in addition to the syntax but the computation doesn't give you the, what's in addition to the syntax, so the computers do not understand. Computation is not sufficient for cognition because cognition involves semantics and syntax is not semantics. In one sentence, the computational processes are syntactical processes. Human cognition consists of, also of semantic processes, so the, the Computational operations by themselves are never sufficient for cognition. You have to have something in addition to the symbols. Uh, and that's, well, it's such an obvious point, but you'd be surprised. I mean, this uh, debate went on for years and years, and there was a whole bunch of books published. was called a Chinese Room Argument, and uh, people even said I was being uh, racist 
I am putting down the Chinese or something. I don't know, that's how kind of crazy things were said. Uh, but in any case, I think I won that argument. I don't hear much about it lately. I think people accept, okay, it's a mistake to think that computation by itself is sufficient for cognition because computation is syntactical and, com and, and uh, cognition requires semantics, requires something in addition. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's a great example. And I think it's extensible to deep learning and neural networks because just because you program a neural network yeah. to recognize every breed of dog that existed, that doesn't mean the neural network knows the, all the other connotations of what yeah. owning a dog is all about. It doesn't. It just knows how to follow the rules of the program. But what got left out of all of this was consciousness. Yeah. You see, in order to recognize my dog, I have to be conscious. And in order for my dog to recognize me, it has to be conscious. And I, cognitive science, at least in the early days, had nothing to say about consciousness because they didn't know what to say about it. They didn't know how to deal with it. And I used to go to the meetings of the Cognitive Society and say, we've got to start talking about consciousness. And this would always produce groans. Oh my God, there he goes on about consciousness. And people, and, and people from MI would say, it's actually West Coast. You know, and they have a lot of touching feeling about on the West Coast. Uh, and so there was a lot of uh, nonsense. But now I think people have come to recognize the centrality of consciousness to human cognition. Roughly speaking, no consciousness, no cognition. A lot of cognition is unconscious but it's cognitive only because it's accessible to consciousness. The results come out as conscious thoughts. Uh, anyway, all of that, I don't know how much of that still goes on. That was many years ago. Yeah. Still, you know, you can see in your science, uh, yeah. the way they interpret their uh, results and their experiments, uh, this idea of uh, the brain and, you know, going through all these inferences yeah. and calculating yeah. and how, you know, you are going to have to catch the ball and actually the brain is frantically yeah. you yeah. Know, running all this uh, math. Yeah. And um, so you see this pervasive. And I think you also developed, you had a, an addenda to uh, your Chinese argument. You had added something about yeah. syntax and physics. Yeah. And uh, can you say something well, about how that came out? Okay. I mean, it is kind of fun. I, I thought the arguments that those guys gave were kind of silly, uh, but here's how it went. Uh, my dog is pretty good, or at least one of my dogs is pretty good at catching balls off a wall. My present dog's too lazy to do it, but, but I had a dog who was terrific at catching balls bounced off a wall. You would throw the ball and hits the wall, and he will go unerringly to where it is, where it's going to be. Now, how does he do it? Well, the standard cognitive science model says he does a number of computations. Uh, figure, first, he has to figure out uh, that the angle of instance equals the angle of reflection. So he calculates the angle of instance and then calculates the angle of reflection on the base of that. Furthermore, the ball will go in a parabolic trajectory, uh, the flatness of which is a function of impact uh, velocity, the coefficient of elasticity in the ball, and you have to have a certain amount of drag for wind resistance. So poor Russell, that was the dog who was good at catching balls, poor Russell had to do an enormous amount of mathematics to get the <laughs> damn ball, because he had to calculate impact velocity and calculate uh, a, a reflection velocity on the base of impact velocity minus a certain coefficient of elasticity. And he also had to calculate the effect of uh, wind resistance. And remember, he has to calculate a parabolic trajectory because it's not a catenary or anything like that. He's got to work with parabolas. Poor doggy has to do an enormous amount of math. And I think that's just silly. He doesn't do an enormous amount of math. What does he do? Well, he does what I would do. Figure out where the damn ball's going to go and try to put your mouth there. And you largely do that on the base of trial and error. I mean, just think, you know, I'm running around on all fours trying to catch these balls. That's what I would do. And if somebody says, yeah, but what about the, the parabolic trajectory? I don't know about parabolic trajectories. I figure the ball's going to go here because I've had a certain amount of trial and error with these balls. Now, that is how I think, in fact, it works. But the temptation is to think, well, that's not science. Science has to show how the brain is really a digital computer computing all of these complex phenomena. And a, a, a hundred step argument comes in, into play here. There just isn't time for the brain to go through all this computation. And the key thing that gets left out is consciousness. You must calculate, you must figure 
that the poor animal is conscious and then is trying to figure out on the basis of conscience where the ball is going to go and then he put his, puts his mouth where he thinks it's going to go. And in fact, doggies get pretty good at this. Yeah. Oh, I'm just, once you're done. What? I was just going to ask somebody once you're done. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, so, uh, would something like the, uh, uh, the quest for certainty in modern philosophy rather than trusting rules of thumb, is there, is there something to say about uh, consciousness or uh, human thinking being basically a collection of rules of thumb? Eh, it's not there, it's not there, yeah. not good enough. And it's just good enough rather than being exactly mathematically certain. Yeah. Well, I think even that's too uh, intellectual. I, I think an awful lot of the time we deal with, with life without, without being in an epistemic frame of mind. There's, I don't come here and think, they're really people. <laughs> <laughs> and most of them are conscious. Maybe not all of them, but most of them are. I don't think that. I just take it for granted. I take it for granted these are uh, chairs and tables, that these are people. I don't, uh, I'm not solving an epistemic problem. I mean, uh, epistemic means knowledge. I'm not trying to figure out how do I know it's really a person? How did I make the inference of the person? I didn't make an inference. I just looked at all these uh, people and recognized them as people. So I think it's a mistake to think that our basic attitude to reality is epistemic. We're busy solving epistemic problems. Now, we might. I go out to my car, ready to tear away uh, to do something, and the damn thing won't start. And then I figure, well, why won't it start? And then I start becoming a, an epistemologist. Is there enough gas in the tank? Uh, I, I, did I really leave the ignition on overnight? I, I, I do all the epistemic crap when there's a breakdown. But as long as there's no breakdown, why should I be in an epistemic uh, frame of mind? Watch the warriors and ask themselves, ask yourself, do they have to really think unconsciously? Be sure to throw a parabola, a parabolic trajectory. No, they just look, there's the damn best and they try and throw it in. That's what I would do and these guys are pretty good at it and so on. So I think it is a mistake. And it's a mistake It really goes back to 17th century philosophy to think our basic relation to the world is epistemic and we're busy solving epistemological problems all the time. I don't think our basic relation is epistemic. It tends to be epistemic when something goes wrong. And you think, well, why won't it start? And then you have to be, uh, go through this epistemic stance. Yeah. Yeah, that, that sounds very much like Heidegger in terms of yeah. things that are ready to hand. And yeah. you just use them unless they break or something that's not there, then you go through the problem of solving for it. Yeah, well, maybe that's right. I'm no Heideggerian, but Heidegger thought that our basic stance is not present at hand, but it's ready to hand where you just assume uh, that things work and you assume that you, uh, the way that a cup works is like this. And you assume a whole lot of uh, things functioning in certain ways. And that's our basic sense. And then the present at hand where you figure out, you get a theory of it, that's when something breaks down. If it turns out that it wasn't really liquid in here, it was a solid block of something. I don't know what the hell happened to the coffee I put in there. Then I start to become epistemic. Yeah. Wittgenstein was similar. Wittgenstein thought a lot of the times we just act. We don't have to have a theory on the basis of which we act. Now the question, of course, is language. Because language, of course, is theoretical. And we are uh, busy solving epistemic problems. What did that guy mean when he said that? And you especially become acute uh, in this when you go to a foreign country where your knowledge of the language is imperfect. And there you're busy solving. What the hell did the guy uh, mean when he said that. So you're busy solving these problems. But in, a, in the language, in your home language, if you're dealing with people uh, that you're familiar with and you're confident, you don't, uh, you're not busy solving a whole lot of epistemic problems. Uh, when the guy said hi, what did he really mean? I mean, you got to be really some kind of intellectual to worry about that uh, in most cases. Uh, but there are cases where you do worry about it, and that's what intellectuals get paid to do. I mean, if you think, think of how you would translate a difficult French poet. My favorite is Stéphane Mallarmé. Now, the problem with Mallarmé is it's not that you can't translate it into English. I can't translate it into French. I mean, I go and look at Mallarmé. If you think you, that, that uh, French, that symbolist poetry doesn't really pose an intellectual problem, 
try your hand, try your hand at Malame. I have three different books of translation of Malame, and very competent uh, English-speaking translators will translate the same poem in three different ways. And you can see why. They don't have any idea what the hell it means in French. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I, I regard that as a challenge. I think that just makes it more interesting. <coughs> yeah? Going back to your dog, to Russell, uh, trying to catch the ball. So when uh, people see Russell got going through all his math, yeah. isn't that an interpretation of what's going on in France as if they uh, were performing syntactical operations? And yeah. isn't syntax actually something that is observer relative? Yeah. Well, okay, uh, this is another objection that I make to these guys. Uh, it isn't. Uh, see, my initial objection is uh, that the syntax is not sufficient for the semantics and the computation is just syntactical. But there's a deeper point which Margaret just made, and that is that <coughs> a syntax is observer relative. Uh, uh, the stuff I write on the blackboard is only syntax relative to our capacity to interpret it syntactically. Syntax does not name a feature of physics. There's no physical property that all syntactical objects have in common that would make them syntactical. In a way that force, mass, gravitational attraction are, con are features of physics. You can identify gravitational attraction independent of any observer. Uh, you can't do that with syntax. Syntax is observer relative. It only exists relative to somebody capable of giving a syntactical interpretation. Uh, and in the old Chinese room days, people would used to say, yeah, but suppose uh, you were locked in this room uh, and uh, you had these symbols coming in uh, all the same. I, they would have certain properties that identified them as Chinese symbols. And I want to say, no, just uh, take an actual case. Suppose uh, I get a symbol in China. This will be in a dialect of Chinese some of you won't recognize. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, I get uh, these symbols. I don't know what the hell it means, but it says when you get a symbol like that, put it next to a symbol that looks like this, the same dialect of Chinese. I, for me, it's, these are just objects. I don't know if this is a Chinese symbol. That's all observer relative. I can identify lines on a, a board just by uh, seeing them, but the, to identify it as a syntactical object or as something in Chinese, that's all observer relative. You have to add an interpretation. You have to have something. You have to assume there's something in addition to the physics. So the original argument was syntax in the Chinese room was that syntax is not sufficient for semantics. But this is a deeper argument. This says physics is not sufficient for syntax. In order to identify something as a syntactical object, as a sentence of a language, you have to have some interpretation. You have to interpret it in a certain way. Yeah? Um, so does that mean that syntax isn't inherent in objects out in the world? It, it is something we sort of superimpose on these objects? Right. That's it. The idea is, if you think of features of reality that exist independent of any human intentionality, call them observer-independent features, syntax is observer-relative. Something is a sentence only relative to somebody's capacity to interpret it. And there may be, for all I know, people who can interpret those uh, marks on the on the blackboard as uh, sentences, but I can't. I mean, for me, it's just a bunch of marks on a blackboard and it was deliberately made as such. So there's a, a set of massive confusions and they're related. Uh, the biggest confusion of all is behaviorism. If it behaves as if it understood, then it really understands. And that's wrong. I mean, I have uh, computers uh, that can behave as if they understood English, but they don't. Uh, they're designed to behave as if they did, but they don't because they have no way to get from the syntax to the semantics. And, the se and, the, and then that leads to the second mistake. The mistake is to suppose if you've got syntactical objects and the right operations performed on them, then you've got the semantics because that's all there is to the semantics is the manipulation of syntax. And that's wrong. And that's, uh, again, a ma the mistake of behaviorism. But then the deepest mistake of all is the one uh, that Margaret was pointing at, and that is to forget 
syntax is not a feature of physics. Syntax is not something that is discovered in the world independent of physics, uh, independent of intentionality. Rather, you have to add intentionality to interpret it syntactically. For a long time, nobody knew how to translate the Mayan hieroglyphs. Uh, I don't know if they translated them or not, but the point is, I, but in order to undertake the task of translating them, you have to make a prodigious set of assumptions. You have to assume these marks were produced by human intentionality, and they were produced by human intentionality with certain types of uh, semantic contents. And consequently, the syntactical object only becomes a syntactical object because it is interpreted as a syntactical object, was intended as a syntactical object. So an enormous amount of intellectual apparatus is presupposed when you take marks and decide you're going to try and figure out what they mean. You have to interpret they were intended as syntactical and they were intended as syntactical bearing a certain semantic content. Yeah? So uh, things like shape or mass or weight, yeah. um, are these properties that are inherent? These in the are observer independent features of reality. Some of them are relative. So for example, weight is only relative. If we all walk on the moon, we could finally take great big steps because uh, we don't weigh as much on the moon. So uh, weight is, is uh, relative, but the phenomena that we're interested in in, uh, in philosophy and cognition are not just relative, but they're observer relative. They are what they are, only relative to human intentionality. And the test is ask yourself if there were no human beings, if there had never been any human beings, what would be left? And what's left are those things that are not observer, uh, 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 intentionality relative, uh, those things that exist like a force and mass and gravitational attraction. Some of them are relative uh, like gravitational attraction, but they are not observable because they don't depend on observers. They don't depend on intentionality for their existence. Maybe intentionality relative would be, would be that, a better term. Well, okay, let me mention a couple of things. We've only got a few minutes. Um, I didn't tell you about some of the contemporary mistakes. The uh, basic assumption on which the tradition rests is that you could have a hallucination that was indistinguishable from a veridical perception. And then the argument goes, well, what did you see in the case of hallucination? The correct answer is you didn't see anything. That's what made it a hallucination. But the philosophical tradition says, well, you must see something. After all, it looks just like the real thing. You must see something, even if it's not the real thing, even if it's only a sense data. OK, that's a disaster, one of the great disasters in the history of philosophy. There's a minor disaster uh, that exists only, roughly speaking, in the shadow of the Campanile and the other such places. And that's called disjunctivism. And the reason I mention that is it's a very popular view in Berkeley, even though it's hopelessly confused. The disjunctivist says the visual experience in the hallucinatory case cannot be the same as in the veridical case. The hallucination and the veridical experience must be different. There must be a disjunction, that's why it's called disjunctivism, between the veridical experience and the hallucinatory experience. Now the argument is back to front. Here's how it goes. If the visual experience and the hallucinatory experience were exactly the same, then naive realism would be false. But naive realism is true, Therefore, there cannot be the same. In fact, some authors even say, the reason for accepting disjunction is uh, disjunctivism is I want to preserve naive realism. This is such a massive set of confusions. But anyway, the basic assumption is so, assuming that naive realism denies implicitly that the experience can be the same. It doesn't, because here's what it looks like. In the case of the naive realist, uh, here's the guy. He sees the object, and then in the case of the hallucination, the guy has the visual experience without an object. There's nothing on the other end. 
Now the argument goes, well, if that were so, then you'd have to deny naive realism because here the guy would be seeing the visual experience and that's the mistake. The guy doesn't see anything in the hallucinatory case. But the disjunctivists say the hallucination cannot be like the visual experience in all respects because if that were true, naive realism would be false because naive realism says that the, uh, the object is actually part of the perception. Now that is, I think, I hope I've made it clear, is a massive confusion. And the, and the key point is to see, you don't discover that this experience in here is like this one in here. You postulate it. It's like, you see, when the teacher says, let X be the number of sheep, and there's always some kid who's a beginning philosopher, and he says, how do you know X is the number of sheep? Well, the answer is, you don't know it. You stipulate it. You decide. Now, similarly, in the case of, the, of a hallucinatory experience, we don't discover that the hallucination is like the visual experience. We postulate it. We stipulate it. We stipulate that you, you have this, which is the naive realist case. Just subtract all of that. This is what's left. And there's no argument. I've never seen any argument that said, well, it couldn't be what's left. The argument is a bad argument that says, well, if there were something left that was the same, then naive realism would be false. Because that's a mistake about naive realism. Naive realism supposes that if you subtract the object in the naive realist um, uh, uh, story, in the naive realist picture, then there's nothing left that can be at, that can be accurately simulated, and that's just that's worse than bad philosophy. It's bad neurobiology because, of course, this is entirely produced by neurobiological processes, and you just postulate that the same neurobiological processes are present in the two cases. Uh, however, I, though if this junctivism seems to be obviously false, it's, uh, uh, Berkeley amazingly has become one of the world capitals of disjunctivism, and you can't throw uh, a stone in Moses all without hitting a disjunctivist. <laughs> They're running around the hallways. Um, but uh, in any case, I don't, I don't take it seriously, but you ought to be uh, uh, forewarned. You ought to know that it exists as a uh, theory, and the, and the argument for it is, as one guy said, is, well, I'm a disjunctivist to preserve naive realism. And the answer is you can preserve naive realism without making this mistake. Naive realism just says in the veridical case you directly see the object. In so doing you have an experience and you can have an experience just like that even if there were no object there. That's not a, a very deep thought. Yes, Mark, oh, you first. How do you distinguish, uh, in the, how would you distinguish between hallucination and that other than the objective reality? How do you yeah. personally know? Well, it, it, this is the traditional problem of skepticism. See, the argument goes, if the hallucination can be exactly the same as the visual experience, as the veridical experience, how do you know it's veridical? And there, there are a lot of variations on this in the history of philosophy. One of my favorites is the brain in a vat. You could imagine that your life was spent as a brain in a vat of nutrients and people fed you, here comes a magic word, with a computer. They have a computer that feeds stimulus into the brain. So it's just like you're giving a lecture in Berkeley, California. In fact, of course, you're just a brain in a vat in Duluth, Minnesota in the 27th century. Uh, and, and some kind lab assistant had plugged in an old California tape. Uh, so you're living a life uh, in California even though you're just a brain in a vat. Everybody gets a picture of this is the brain in the vat. Now, there are, I think the brain of that is a useful thought experiment because there's a sense that we are going to invest. This is a kind of that, and all of our experiences come from a stimuli coming in through the that. I, but I don't think this gives any grounds for skepticism. The standard, a uh, one standard interpretation is, well, maybe we are going to invest. No, I don't think that's a serious hypothesis. Uh, that they, uh, uh, it, it, the evidence for that is so, uh, that we're not bringing to that, it's so overwhelming, it's not even uh, proper to describe it as evidence. It's sort of a background set of assumptions that we make for coping with the world. However, there's no question that the, uh, these are traditional forms of skepticism. And the skepticism always takes the same form. It says, 
However good your evidence is, you could have exactly that evidence and still be mistaken. Uh, that's the argument for skepticism. Now, I think there are answers to that argument, but that's another lecture that goes beyond, uh, beyond perception. Yeah. Yeah. Um, reading your stuff for this class on perception, I, I, I was connecting the conversation with representationalism and all this stuff with my own frustration within the social sciences and yeah. relativism and postmodernism and all these things where, you know, there is nothing that's there there. And the frustration with that, and I was curious, first, thank you so much yeah. for being here this morning, but uh, I was curious your own personal opinion then on, on meaning and truth and values yeah. and how language then from the first utterance of symbols that yeah. then try to articulate itself fit onto reality. Yeah. We always, the philosophical discussion is so interested in truth and meaning right there, how, but yeah. what about when these things evolve and then form myths and stories and all this stuff, yeah. and then without making truth claims about God, but truth claims about reality. Yeah. How, myths, archetypes, these yeah. things that perpetuate themselves throughout time. Can you yeah. speak to that? Well, okay, but uh, the question always nail it down to specific examples. Uh, uh, there is a guy who's president of the United States. It's kind of hard to believe he is, but it's not just a myth. It's actually, it's Donald Trump who's president of the United States, uh, and uh, Benjamin Franklin is not president of the United States. Uh, never was president of the United States. Now, how do you know? Well, there are answers to that. And those answers will tell you decisively that I know that Donald Trump was president of the United States and uh, Benjamin Franklin was never president of the United States. But that's it. The mistake is to think, well, when you're through that, all the same, you have to show that it's impossible that Benjamin Franklin could have been president. Well, it's not impossible. Well, it might have turned out, not now, he's been dead for too long, but it might have turned out that he uh, became president. And it certainly might have turned out that Donald Trump did not become president. But there are ways of finding out, and that's what we know. We know, in fact, that Donald Trump was president. There was a period uh, of so-called postmodernism. It was so absolutely dreadful, I couldn't believe it, that this had stuck its head up. But I don't know, maybe it's disappeared by now, I hope so. I had some fights with these guys. There was a Frenchman named Debbie Da, and I had some debates <laughs> with him. Uh, but I assumed all that died out. It was no, super preposterous. No, it still goes it's wrong. It's very much alive, just, but that's why he's asking because they have to endure it, in, especially in the social sciences. Uh, yeah. Well, okay. I mean, I have written stuff about these guys, and, and you can read it. But I never thought. I mean, life's too short to spend it going around and shooting Derry uh, and, <laughs> and I don't think he actually believed it himself. I mean, it was kind of a yeah, a game that he played, and I didn't take it seriously, but maybe people still do. Well, um, well take Judith Butler here at the University yeah. of Berkeley and gender studies, then how, again, using postmodern, using that there's no there there, and then performative use of language, how you can articulate truths, and it's all relative. So then gender, there's infinite, despite you asking any biological scientists, that's not true, that's not how... Yeah. That's not how the well, I think you know, there are a whole lot of interesting questions about gender. I mean, uh, uh, the fact that the X and Y chromosome, that's not observer relative. I mean, there are, those things actually exist as parts of biology. But now, how we decide to treat people and what we decide to count as masculine and what is feminine, yeah, okay, that's all uh, culturally relative. But I, what's the problem? I mean, once you sort out all the details, uh, there's no deep metaphysical issue. The idea is it gets bad only if you think, well, really, there aren't any such things as uh, males and females. No, that's wrong. I, anybody who raises dogs knows. Uh, <laughs> and it's just a plain fact. And we can identify the basis for it in the X and Y chromosome. So there's a lot of silliness that goes on. And I'm sorry to say a lot of it goes on in humanities departments. But I thought it kind of died of its own preposterousness, but maybe not, it still goes on. Well, I'll leave you guys to fight it then. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. All right, thank you.